Good evening and welcome to this debate organized by the Catalan National Assembly. The topic of today's discussion is the immunity waiver at the European Parliament for the three Catalan MEPs and to what extent it represents a threat for fundamental rights at the European Union. As you probably know, in 2017, following a popular mandate after the 2015 election, the Catalan government held an independence referendum. The Spanish court forbade such referendum and the Spanish government, government repressed it with brutal police force against peaceful voters in order to seize ballot boxes and intimidate people. Despite all this, more than 2 million people exercise the right to self-determination with more than 90% of the voters in favor of independence. Following those events, Spanish authorities launched a repressive wave against Catalan political and social leaders and thousands of peaceful pro-independence activists using fake accusations of violence, embezzlement, and in some cases, <laughs> terrorism. As a result, nine political and social leaders were put in arbitrary detention. As mentioned in reports by the UN and Amnesty International, and were tried and sentenced for up to 13 years of prison. Several others were forced into exile. So far, up to 3,300 Catalan representatives and activists have been repressed by Spanish authorities. Three of these exiles are Carlos Puigdemont, president of Catalonia during the 2017 referendum, Tony Comín, who was the Catalan health minister at that time, and Clara Punsati, who was the head of the education ministry. Spanish Supreme Court has attempted to extradite them, them to Spain, but judges from Germany, Belgium, and Scotland have refused to do so based on, on their belief that the accusations are baseless, and in some cases, that they would never have a fair trial in Spain. These three leaders ran to the 2019 European Parliament elections and were elected as MEPs with more than a million votes cast by European citizens. Spanish courts tried to unlawfully prevent them from taking their seats and now have requested the European Parliament to waive their immunity as MEPs to, with the ultimate goal to someone get them extradited from any other European country. For today's discussion, we are immensely pleased to have with us Clara Punsati. Good evening and welcome. Uh, Dr. Punsati, as said before, was the Catalan Health Minister in 2017. She went into exile to Brussels the, that same October of 2017. And in March 2018, returned to Scotland where she resumed teaching as professor at St. Andrews University. After the 2019 election, she became a member of the European Parliament. It is also a pleasure to come with the presence of Dr. Vincent Yelt Heltins, who is a doctor in history and a member of Power in History Center for Political History at the University of Antwerp. His PhD dissertation was on Flemish and Walloon identity construction. He's a member of the Scientific Council for the Archive and Research Center for National Movements. He also publishes on nationalism and national identity construction, the political history of Belgium, the history of the left, and Spain's contemporary history. Welcome to our debate, Dr. Heltins. Now, uh, we start with our first question uh, for Dr. Punsati, uh, which is, considering the political majorities at the European Parliament and the influence of the three Spanish parties at the EPP, the Socialist and Renew Group, the chances of winning the vote uh, are quite unlikely. The case is expected to end up at the EU Court of Justice where the European Parliament's decision to waive the immunity may be repealed. Taking into account this new likely slap in the face, to say so, of the EU court to the EU Parliament concerning the Catalan case, 
Do you think its reputation as a democratic chamber may be a road? In general, what are the potential implications of this immunity waiver for the right of political participation at the European Union? Uh, good evening, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and thank you for organizing this and thanks for the all participants and people attending this session. Um, well, uh, the vote is still uh, pending and we're gonna be arguing and discussing with as many MEPs as we can during the next week. Uh, so we still haven't given up on a, you know, on a favorable decision at the plenary. Uh, we know it's difficult. Uh, we're not, uh, you know, over optimistic, but still we think that this is going to be each, each individual MEP decision on a vote that will be secret. Uh, and because the vote will be secret, it's, you know, it's a matter of conscience of each of the members of the parliament to decide whether they want to remove our immunity or not. Um, what, uh, what is the situation right now? Uh, the jury committee, which is the committee that takes place of the preparation of these kind of uh, cases, has already approved reports that request uh, the removal of our immunity. Uh, this was approved uh, last week by a vote of 15 votes favorable to the three reports, eight votes against and two abstentions. Uh, it's important to realize that this committee is composed of five uh, Spanish MEPs out of 25. Uh, the chair is a Spanish MEP of the Ciudadanos Party who is clearly partisan in this uh, cause, and that the three cases were conflated into one. These are three individual cases because it's three individual MEPs that a judge is requesting the immunity to be removed. Uh, but the committee decided that the three cases were going to be treated as one. Uh, and therefore they allocated the reports, which are three, officially three different reports to, a, to a just one um, rapporteur. This rapporteur is uh, Mr. Zembatsky, who's a Bulgarian uh, extreme right uh, MEP that sits very friendly with Vox in the ECR group. The ECR group is a very complex uh, variety very varied group because it also includes uh, the NVA and other you know, perfectly democratic forces, but it includes Vox and it includes this gentleman, the Zembatsky, uh, who has participated in events in the parliament with Mr. Ortega Smith, who was uh, very active in the prosecution of the case in the Supreme Court. And during that event, the Zoran Puigdemont a prison was uh, boasted and he was, you know, clapping to that uh, Zoran. So it's very clear that this gentleman is not a neutral uh, report, reporter. And moreover, uh, he has been taking care of uh, reporting both um, the cases of Mr. Puigdemont and Mr. Comin, which are similar in the sense that their cases were seen in a Belgian court that they entered simultaneously as members of, of the European Parliament in the June election and that the accusations against them are the same, sedition and malfeasance of funds. And my case, uh, which is different, substantially different because first I was not an MEP until uh, January last year after Brexit because my extradition case was being seen in Scotland and because my case uh, in the prosecutor in Spain is only claiming, accusing me of uh, sedition, not of malfeasance of funds. Okay, so these are very different cases, but nevertheless, uh, not only he wrote the same report, uh, he clearly did a cut and paste exercise 
and forgot to cut some of the things that were supposed to be cut in my report. So the fact is that the committee voted a report in which, in my case, in which the, the allegations are that I have been accused both of a situation of malfeasance of funds. Okay, this could be taken as a detail, but it's not a detail, it's just, you know, a very clear evidence that the procedure has not respected a minimal standard of neutrality and uh, professionalism. Uh, so therefore, uh, there are other objects. We've sent uh, many of procedural objections. There was a long list of documentation that, that uh, we think is relevant and that rapporteur should have uh, taken into account in his report. Uh, it's difficult that he has taken it into account because it was never translated. Uh, there is a number of uh, def defects in the, in the whole process. We're not satisfied at the way, um, you know, we were, uh, our case was uh, managed. We are also very uh, critical of the non-neutrality of the chair of the committee that uh, has uh, uh, repeatedly appeared in the press expressing his opinions uh, and that has celebrated the result of the vote as a political victory, which is again evidence that this is a political uh, prosecution, which is our main, uh, our main argument. Uh, this, uh, our immunity should not be lifted because the request to lift it is the result of a political prosecution. And therefore, you know, if it's a political prosecution, that's a case of Fumus prosecution, and that's a very clear case. It's very clear that in this case, the parliament should refuse it. Anyway, the fact is that the very, uh, you know, intense agenda of the Spanish MEPs to have this case resolved uh, for the moment has been successful. Uh, and it's now going to the plenary in which it's difficult that uh, MEPs uh, break the vote discipline. And it's very likely, we still don't know for sure, but it's very likely that the, the big politics to vote along the same lines they voted in the committee. Uh, the votes in the committee are secret, but we know that the, the Popular Party, uh, the European Popular Party uh, wanted to uh, support this removal of immunity. We also know that the, social, the Spanish Socialist Party is extremely powerful in the social democrat uh, groups. Uh, and Ciudadanos is also very influential in Renew. So if these three groups uh, were to vote in a disciplined way, we would certainly lose that, uh, that vote. Uh, we know that not everybody in the EPP, not everybody in the Social Democrats, not everybody in the, in the Renew Group will uh, agree to vote in favor of that report. So there will be votes against it. Uh, it's, an, it's, 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 it's very uh, difficult to say at this point, uh, if I have to take a bet, uh, at this point my, my bet would be that we will not win that in the plenary, but it's still not, not, not there. And people are becoming more and more aware of the fact that it's going to be very problematic for the European Parliament to approve that uh, those removals of immunity, because yes, we feel that we have not been treated fairly, that removing our immunity is not just removing our immunity, is a campaign to stop us from doing our job as representatives of more than 1 million people. And therefore, if the vote approves to remove our immunity, we will appeal that decision to the European Court of Justice. Uh, we... Of course, the European Court of Justice may take a long time. I mean, it's uncertain. It's, we cannot be sure that uh, the European Court of Justice will support our claims. We think that we have a very strong case, especially because the procedure has been so 
um, how would I say, sloppy. Uh, but still, this is going to be a, a problem. And it would certainly be, uh, you know, a, a, a terrible uh, loss of prestige for the parliament if the European Court of Justice were to say to, you know, tell the parliament that they are, uh, you know, removing immunity illegally uh, to their members. So that 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 would be certainly, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it would be a, be a shame. Uh, so I think this argument, in addition to the straight argument that our immunity should not be removed because this is a political prosecution, this argument may have still some influence from now until the end of uh, the week and the more and more members of parliament realize that this is problematic, uh, the higher are the chances that the majority of the parliament decides against it, but it's still uh, uncertain. Um, I'm not sure, but I yeah, would yeah, probably yeah. leave it. Yeah. It, 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 it was very clear, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. It was, it was a, a really throughout answer. Okay, now Thank let's you. move to the Spanish uh, repressive actions. So this question is for you, Dr. Heltins. Um, so the Spanish repressive, repressive actions and the way the Spanish authorities are historic, have historically coped with the political dissident, especially against the Catalan and the Basque uh, people. Considering Spanish authorities' reaction to the Catalan pro-independence movement, and its judiciary attitude, especially since October 2017, uh, since the referendum, do you think it is conceivable any other kind of behavior from the Spanish side, uh, maybe a more democratic one in dealing with the Catalan issue? Well, uh, uh, in any way, a more democratic behavior from the side of the Spanish state would be uh, desirable and it would be very uh, necessary. Uh, what Catalan independentism is for the Spanish state, it is a political challenge. And a political challenge has to be uh, dealt with in, on a political level. Now, what we see systematically uh, from the side of the Spanish state is that that kind of political challenges are dealt with on judicial level. Huh? You have a juridification of, yes, a political struggle. And that, even from the viewpoint of the Spanish state itself, it is very counterproductive because, of course, nothing is solved. Uh, moreover, uh, the accusations that the Spanish state launched against the Catalan leaders are very implausible. Eh? There is almost nobody in Europe today who believes charges like sedition, violence, etc. Eh? As uh, Miss Ponsati said, uh, neither Belgium, Germany, neither Scotland followed uh, that way of thinking and acting towards the Catalan leaders. So what is the core of the problem then with the Spanish state? And for that, we have to go quickly back to the transition from dictatorship uh, to parliamentary uh, democracy in the second half of the 70s, um, where you didn't have a clear break, a clear cut, with dictatorship uh, and, as some people said, the democratic forces were too weak to impose a clear cut and the dictatorial forces were too weak to maintain dictatorship. So instead of a relation of power, you had a relation of weakness. But the dramatic consequence is that you didn't have a large movement throughout the institutions to get rid of all what was uh, relics of the Franco regime. It wasn't the case in the army. It wasn't the case in the police. It even wasn't the case on the political level with Alianza Popular. Uh, and it was certainly not the case 
in uh, the courts and the law. Of course, physically, those people, uh, we are several uh, decades later, those people are not physically in charge. Most of them died or are uh, very old and not active anymore. But the way of acting, the way of acting is continuing. And a set of ideas has continued to exist inside the Spanish state. A big problem, more concretely, is of, of, of the uh, a sign of, of the fact that uh, there wasn't a clear break is exactly the constitution that was adopted in 1978, a constitution that divided Spain in 17 autonomous communities, uh, uh, a bit to address on a false base the Catalan and the Basque challenge, and in, in lesser in with the lesser weight, the Galician challenge, eh? the so-called historical nationalities that had claims towards Spain and that had traditions of self-government, strong traditions of self-government. So that constitution uh, and the so-called unity of Spain is the core around which today large parts of the Spanish state and the Spanish state institution organize themselves. In my country, at least the country where I live in Belgium, six times we changed the constitution, six times we changed the constitution to initiate institutional changes. Belgium was a unitary state when it was created. Today, it is a federal state. Today, and maybe tomorrow, people and political forces and social forces will even discuss a confederal model. In Catalonia, we see, certainly since, uh, let's say, seven, eight years, uh, five, six years, we see a parliamentary majority, and since a few weeks, also a majority in votes, of people who say we need an institutional change. Of course, those people say independence. No, I'm not, Catal I'm not Catalan. It's not to me to pronounce myself on uh, independence of not. That is the task of the Catalan people, of the people li li living in Catalonia. But when you have such a majority, you have, uh, you have a legitimate, political challenge that you have to address in a democratic political way. And if the Spanish state is not prepared to do that, is not prepared to go beyond uh, the constitution of 78, then you, you have a problem that, that will maintain. Now, very special in Spain, it is not the only country in Europe, but it is, uh, of course, uh, a, a very um, clear thing, is that lots of the people who maintain the idea of a central authoritarian state around institutions in Madrid against autonomous communities, against other majorities, against other political preferences, those people are not only active in the open political uh, field, but also encrusted in what we can call in Spain the deep state, elements of the deep state. If we see today how police forces are acting in the street, you can ask yourself, who is giving orders to those people to beat people up who are demonstrating pacifically, who are demonstrating for the freedom of uh, an artist who is imprisoned on the base of the lyrics he uses. Eh? Only that example, like the example of the three uh, European uh, parliamentary members, uh, 
uh, and the, the imprisoned other political leaders are examples of a deep state that is even prepared to go against part of its own central government. In that government, along the period of democratization in Spain, we had a lot of uh, turnismo turning between the right conservative party and between a social democracy party, a social democratic party, who are both political extensions of the, yeah, how, how say, of the constitution of 78 and of a will, even if it's not democratically based of the will to maintain uh, a Spanish, um, unity now that that party that leads today the party of pedro sanchez and uh, and and which will i fear play a key role in 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 attacking the parliamentary immunity of uh, carla ponsati tony comin and carles puigdemont uh, the social democratic party uh, has for the moment a coalition with the junior partner who has another, basically, I say, another opinion on how to deal with the Catalan problem. Eh? As far as we are well informed, the initial, the initial position of Unidas Podemos is uh, to have a, a, a negotiated referendum. Eh? But anyway, they are in that government. They don't have the tools to to, to, to realize that, and they are themselves under siege by elements of the deep state. So that is a very huge problem uh, with uh, the Spanish state, which is a problem, in my opinion, and not only in my opinion, which is a problem that uh, exists since 1976, 77, 78. 77, the amnesty law, uh, 78, the constitution, etc. Last remark, uh, maybe for the debate. Nonetheless, nonetheless, we have to nuance a little bit uh, the situation. Uh, we cannot clearly, bluntly speak about the political confrontation of two blocks saying, Catalonia and Spain. We know it, it, it's uh, when we see, for example, electoral results, even in Catalonia, a large part of the people living there are not nationalist or uh, independentist or for Catalan sovereignty. That's one thing. Secondly, in Spain, in Spain, uh, fortunately, not everyone agrees with uh, how is dealt with the Catalan majority, and not everybody agrees with uh, the judges who put uh, rapper singers in prison, uh, like uh, Pablo Assel, or who want to put other rappers like Valtonic for three years in prison if they can catch him. So, is this a good thing from a Catalan independentist view? It is a very good thing because it shows that some alliances with forces inside the Spanish, space, the Spanish state are possible, not with the state, but political, social forces who say, we have to change the constitution in Spain, eh? We have to get rid of the monarchy, which is a corrupt institution that is by now proven, eh? that is proved. Uh, we have to have a republic. And when we have a republic, we have to renew a constitution. And everybody has to say where he and she wants to stand inside Arsa or outside Spain or etc. etc. But get rid of the judicialization get rid of the violence, the repression, etc. Okay, thank you very much. Now, uh, Dr. Punsadi, 
Uh, a question on next week's vote on the European Parliament plenary and its and its political implications for the Catalan struggle for independence. Do you think the process for the waiver of immunity is backfiring for Spain's purposes, as far as it is helping to bring the Catalan case to the EU, to the European media and uh, the and the political agenda? In the same vein, do you perceive whether every time more sectors within the European Union institutions are getting uh, irritated with Spain's actions and the way Spain twists EU legal framework uh, in, in persecuting Catalan, Catalan leaders? Well, that, that's, a, that's a good question and I don't have a, a yes, no answer. Uh, it's still unclear because we must recognize that Spanish strategy so far, which has been repression, uh, has not met an institutional response or a critical institutional response in the EU institutions. Uh, the response after repression in the referendum was uh, inexistent, basically, you know, they say, oh, what's going on in Spain? Oh. But there was no critique of what was happening. And so far, they have uh, hypocritically just looked the other way. They don't want to talk. They don't want every time, you know, a question is asked, this is an internal matter of Spain. This is, you know, they are totally disengaged. And we have not seen open criticism of anything that has of what has happened in Spain from the European uh, authorities. Okay, that is the Council, that is the Commission, uh, that's even you know the majority of the Parliament. Okay, so in this sense, the facts for the moment are not uh, giving evidence that this is backfiring. The, the repression is uh, quite uh, harsh. There is that have been uh, convicted to very, very high uh, prison sentences. Uh, now um, being sent to prison. So and the reaction is always, oh, this is an internal matter. Uh, so, of course, uh, we don't know what happens behind the open uh, fora. Uh, there might be subtle, subtle uh, criticism or comments, uh, but so far the Spanish governments have managed to navigate this repressive uh, uh, strategy quite successfully. I mean, we must uh, sort of acknowledge that. Uh, of course, the events of uh, Mr. Borrell's uh, visit uh, to Russia, that has been the first occasion in which uh, the European Union has sort of felt directly uh, the cost of this hypocrisy. Uh, because the European, the, the, the Commission is very active at trying to put limits to uh, the, the weakening of democracy in Hungary and Poland. They are very active in the criticism of the deterioration of the, the rule of law in Poland and Hungary, but they insist on not looking at how things are in Spain. And that is a, an inconsistency that, you know, that eventually will backfire, eventually will cause problems. And, you know, in the visit, of uh, Mr. Borrell to Russia has obviously cost, uh, uh, had some cost. I mean, at this point, the uh, High Commissioner for Foreign Affairs uh, has no uh, credibility. You know, it's, it's a joke of a representative. And that's, uh, it's not only, a, it's not just a cost to Mr. Borrell, that's a cost to the whole commission. You know, if you don't have a representative that, uh, commands respect when it, he goes around, uh, you know, trying to, uh, uh, 
to um, transmit a message of defense of human rights, which is part of the very fundamental uh, values of the union. Uh, you cannot do that uh, if you do that selectively. Uh, so in this sense, yes, that should eventually hit uh, the limit. It's probably getting there, but for the moment, the Spanish uh, government has managed to navigate that. Uh, it's true that the Catalan uh, disunion has had an effect on that as well, because Mr. Sanchez, who has been the prime minister in charge for you know, the larger fraction of the imprisonment of the political prisoners, he was put, uh, you know, uh, he took power thanks to the support, among others, of the Catalan uh, members of the Spanish uh, of, the, of the Spanish Parliament, and not very, you know, a few couple of months ago, uh, Esquerra Republicana supported his budget. So as long as he gets this kind of support, he can sell to his uh, uh, European partners, well, I'm getting, I'm working this out internally, I'm getting support because we're going to work this out. I mean, how long can he go on uh, speculating with the political prisoners, with the possibility of pardons uh, and these sort of things? Is that certain? I mean, he clearly played this in a very manipulative uh, way. He's, you know, he was talking about changing the penal code. He was talking about pardons all along until the election. And then the election has come and the results of the election, are, he's not pleased with the results of the election now. And now he's back to, okay, well, uh, we'll think of, you know, there is certainly not uh, prospects of uh, the political prisoners being released anytime soon. Their penit the penitentiary regime is, you know, again, again, uh, in discussion. They now have a semi-open regime. Uh, the prosecutor who is working directly under the orders of the government is now uh, challenging that. And they, they, after the election, they took uh, the rapper Pablo Hassel to prison. Yesterday, they started a case against the president of the Catalan Parliament and the uh, members of the board of the Catalan Parliament for having had a discussion about the monarchy and the right of self-determination. So, you know, they are playing this, uh, um, some, they talk about dialogue, but the fact is that they are, you know, actively very repressive. Uh, can we hope that this will be stopped by the European authorities um, becoming all of a sudden uh, more uh, tough in uh, challenging uh, Spain? Mm, honestly, I'm not especially hopeful of that. I think that, you know, if this uh, only depends on how Catalans manage uh, their, uh, their politics more than what uh, Miss uh, von der Leyen or, you know, Merkel or whatever, they are not going to be the ones that will do, uh, you know, that will stop uh, Mr. Sanchez. Yes, but, but it is true that, for example, after October 1st, many Europeans who didn't realize there was a conflict, after they saw how the state reacted, they understood there was a problem. And now they also see oh, yeah. ways of uh, behaving that are kind of doubtful. That's what I meant with the question. Yes, yes. Okay, no, I mean, of course. I mean, our, our, our case is more, is more well known but it was uh, it was sort of in the big uh, in the big news right around the referendum and you know every once in a while uh, people say oh there is something going on they pay attention uh, but then you know it's not that uh, you know the the view of the international opinion is going to resolve this uh, 
uh, I think it's uh, it's going to be a harder a harder struggle than that, and it's mostly a matter of how uh, the Catalans manage uh, themselves in a way. Mm-hmm. Okay, my... thank you very much. Now, Dr. Heltins, uh, what message do you think the Spanish authorities are trying to send to the Catalan people in acting in this way? Uh, does it at some point backfire also in, for Spain's interest? And what historical lessons do Catalan people need to learn from this when it comes to their struggle for self-determination? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that, that, that's a good question because it continues a bit on what uh, Ms. Ponsati was, uh, was saying. I think the, the, the sign that the Spanish uh, state is, is, is giving to Europe is that they will not allow any fundamental change, any fundamental institutional change uh, and on their, uh, what they call their territoriality. Eh? So they say these are the limits, even if political majorities in the autonomous communities are thinking different, those are the limits. And that's the s- s- sign that uh, Spain uh, is giving, and they are very hard on it. Eh? As we say, uh, the jail, imprisonment, uh, the the implementation of Article uh, 155 of their constitution to take over Catalonia and and to to uh, to to take back the the the, the autonomy of its institutions etc. Now, what does this say about the position of Spain in the international community and in the European Union? I think, and there is a problem which can also be a strategic problem for uh, the Catalan uh, sovereignist or independentist movement. It is, I think, until now, the facts show that it is quite an illusion uh, to think that the European Union will intervene. Uh, Ms. Ponsati has said very clearly Uh, Spain says it's our business, it's an internal problem. Europe says, okay, it's your internal problem, Uh, solve it. Uh, Inside the European Union, inside the European institutions, Spain is an exemplary pupil. Uh, They, after the financial crisis, they implemented harsh austerity as demanded by Europe on their own people hmm, with heavy cuts on uh, social uh, uh, posts, et cetera, et cetera. And even if now the image is uh, damage of Spain, Europe tells in fact Spain that there is nothing fundamentally to worry about. Uh, I think Europe will never as it did in October 2017, it will never uh, recognize uh, Catalan independentism um, because Spain is a good, between brackets, it's a good uh, member state of the European Union. It's its fourth economy. Eh? It's also a heavyweight in the Eurozone. Eh? So Europe needs somehow Spain, and they will not allow that Catalonia, an independent Catalonia, an independent majority in Catalonia, will uh, cut, uh, will bring Spain in problems. I think this is an overall position of Europe, of the European Union, uh, its leaderships. Uh, with maybe, maybe one exception that could be Scotland. Why? Because Scotland never left the European Union. The Scots wanted to remain. It was the state in which Scotland is sitting that left and Scotland who wants to come back, in fact. There, maybe there could be an exception but in general, I think that the European leaderships will say, no, if we allow an independent Catalonia in lots of other member states, the same problem will be 
starting hmm, and we will have huge problems while we have already a social deficit, a democratic deficit, etc., and we can't allow more problems. So that's a problem. It's a strategic uh, challenge for uh, the Catalanist uh, movement, I think. Uh, because as we saw, I think, and, and, and that is true, uh, on the level of the, the image of Spain, uh, they, 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 it, there was a lot of damage in Europe, but it's not a European people in the street who move, who can organize massive demonstrations for uh, the freedom of Catalans or, or, or whoever. Eh? The European Union in first and in the last um, moment is headed by the governments of the strong member states. Mrs. Ponsati said it herself, Angela Merkel, Emmanuel Macron, etc. cetera, uh, Witt van der Leyen, they come together and they decide, etc. And in their decisions, there is no place for an independent Catalonia. So strategically, you are a bit blocked. Huh? Although you have a legitimate political majority in your own nation, but you are a bit blocked. You are blocked when you look at the rest of Spain with Madrid and the institutions, the Spanish state with its deep state, and you are blocked with the European Union that is deaf, deaf for the Catalan uh, uh, message. Eh? Only uh, because you mentioned it, the fact, only the fact that somebody as Borrell is the head of uh, external affairs of the European Union, that's, that's, that's already a joke on itself, eh? but that's a problem. So in one way or another, it is a question for Catalanist movement to find alliances in Europe, of course, but also in the rest of Spanish state. And then it's, it's, it's a question of, does that mean, eh, because, because you, you mentioned it, does that mean that this has to go through uh, supporting the budgets of the investiture or the investiture of a center left government? It could be if you have the, the guarantee that something will come back to the Catalan people, but we saw that till now nothing came back. Of course, there was the corona crisis, eh? the corona pandemic. Eh? It's not a detail. There is a huge social crisis following the corona pandemic. It's not a detail neither. But sooner or later, if you, uh, like Esquera or other forces, eh? like Euskaleria Bildu, when you give that support to the central government, it's part of a strategy in which you expect that something is coming back. Eh? Not only something that gives uh, Pedro Sanchez uh, a mandate to say in Europe, everything is okay. I have a, a, a kind of majority which isn't really a majority, but I'm doing fine. Uh, and it's our internal problem. So there is a, a, a strategic challenge uh, I don't have a solution for it, but what we saw, and I will finish at that point, what we saw since October 2017 is that any attempt of unilateral exit out of an existing member state of the European Union today is something that doesn't work for all those reasons. Unless, unless that you expect to uh, enter in a phase, a, uh, a, a stage uh, outside European Union, outside the Eurozone, uh, which isn't exactly a comfortable uh, stage, of course, because Catalonia is not only the institutions, it's its people, the work of the people, 
uh, employment, uh, its business, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is a legitimate majority to do something, but there is not uh, a context in the European Union, as in the Spanish state, to realize it for the moment. Uh, yes, but as a short follow-up on your last statement about the people, it's also true that on October 3rd, when, uh, well, when the streets were occupied by people, the European Union was willing to negotiate, and after people left, this idea fell down. So mm -hmm. maybe people, people's pressure may have something to say. Mm -hmm. Respect that. It, it, it would be good anyway if if the European institution would send somebody to negotiate. It would be good. Uh, there is a good uh, relation of forces inside Catalonia. But that then you are in a in a framework of negotiations and not of a unilateral uh, exit. But okay, that's strategic. Uh... Okay, thank you very much. Now, Dr. Punsati, um, what is the defense strategy of the MEPs basing its legal arguments on? Uh, what are the potential human rights violations against MEPs by Spanish authorities and EU institutions in case of waiving uh, of immunity? Um, okay, before I answer this question, since this has sort of drifted into a discussion about our chances and our strategic choices about, you know, what's the prospect of our independence uh, agenda, you know, I, I, I will take, uh, you know, 30 seconds to, to make some comments about, uh, about that because uh, I don't want uh, my silence to be interpreted as... Uh, as uh, non opinion. Uh, you know, I, I, I am very well aware of the huge difficulties that we face, uh, but I am uh, also uh, very strongly convinced that any strategic uh, bets that we make on Spain self reforming itself and overcoming the 78 regime on its own by becoming Spain, all of a sudden realizing that they are uh, not, uh, you know, a good democracy and that there is going to be a third Spanish Republic and that will be the door that will open the Catalan self-determination or something like that. Uh, I think that is an absolute illusion. Before that, if I have to believe something, I have more uh, hopes that uh, that uh, some sort of uh, movements may uh, occur uh, within uh, the European powers, not necessarily the institutional uh, powers of the Union, but European powers than anyway I'm you know extremely extremely skeptical of thing of any strategy that bets on uh, on the Spanish uh, on the Spanish left see if you want to call it uh, uh, giving a helping hand because that would require the Spanish socialists all of a sudden becoming uh, Democrats. And if you review the history of the Spanish Socialist Party, uh, I mean, history is, is very definite. They supported Primo de Rivera. They, uh, their role in the Republic uh, was mixed. Uh, their role all through the 40 years of Spanish Francoism was uh, in existence. Uh, so, so, I mean, I don't think that's, uh, it's probably not the, I'm, I'm going to stop here and it's not, I mean, I'm going to go and answer the other question, but, uh, you know, if it can, if, it, if any hope that Mr. Sanchez uh, and his colleagues uh, all of a sudden realize that, you know, that uh, they can be Democrats and that they are 
going to get rid of the monarchy. Well, I think this is, uh, I find this a romantic, uh, romantic uh, dream. Anyway, um, and therefore I don't think that uh, strategies of supporting them in power are strategies that are uh, uh, going to have much success. And mostly I think that when you have hostages, having your hostages negotiate your uh, future is extremely dangerous, and that's what we've been, what what, what we've seen in in the Catalan politics. Uh, all uh, movements of national liberation uh, have very clear that prisoners are not good leaders, and until we realize that, until we all realize that, uh, we'll certainly will have a very, very difficult time uh, formulating a consistent strategy. Anyway, so what was our defense? Uh, uh, so the first argument of our defense is that this request to remove our immunity uh, is a request to put us in prison. Uh, and that is what's totally special and different of any other request to remove immunity that the European Parliament has ever examined. It has never, never happened until our case that a judge uh, requests to move, remove immunity from a member of Parliament to take him or her to prison. All the other, all the precedent cases were cases in which there was some judiciary investigation on the way and the immunity was requested to continue with the investigation to ask for the member of parliament to appear before court and to have eventually a trial. In our case, Mr. Lerena, Lerena wants to take us to prison. That's what he wants. And after that, yes, once he gets us in prison, he will, uh, they will organize another you know, trial at the Supreme Court if that ever happens. If, we ever, you know, if they ever get us, they first we will spend a couple of years of preventive prison, and after that there will, will be a trial. So that's what that's the main argument to say, hey, stop it. You don't put the representative of people in prison before a trial. You don't do that. That's against uh, there are many rulings of the European Court of Human Rights that says uh, you know representatives are not to be held in prison, especially before a trial. So that's the main argument. Uh, apart from that, we've complained that there has been uh, serious, and the, and the proof that this is so is that Mr. Lerena is requesting Parliament to remove our immunity because he knows that to have an extradition, he needs to have uh, immunity lifted, but he very clearly has declared, and it's, you know, very clear, it was appealed and it was confirmed, that if we by accident or by willingness were to see our constituents in Spain and you know, when we went to Barcelona, which is our land, which is our constituency, which is our territory, if we dare to do that, that you know, the minute we put our foot in Spanish territory, we would be caught and imprisoned. And that is what's totally unheard, it has it's never ever happened in the union that a representative, not only an European representative, that a member of some uh, um, legislative has been, you know, put in preventive prison. And that's, that's, uh, that's what a sc democratic scandal and the fact that, uh, that uh, the commission keeps saying that this is an eternal affair is a scandal. And the fact that they don't look at it doesn't mean that we can, that we should keep telling them, hey, what you're doing is a scandal, okay? So that's the main reason. Apart from that, okay, we've complained about the procedural defects. I've already commented about the, the procedural defects that this case has the more visible ones. And of course, we've all, we, all, we are also claiming that this judge is not competent because our case, the fact that this case is being, uh, um, trial at the Supreme Court, that is a violation of rights. And uh, there is uh, several independent uh, um, 
sentences about that, the, the working group on arbitrary detentions, uh, the, the Belgian court, the appeals court in Belgium, they've all uh, ruled that we should be trialed by a judge in Barcelona, not by the Supreme Court of Madrid. Uh, so this, this uh, Judge Arena is not the competent judge, that should be enough. Uh, furthermore, the allegations, the fact that you know, we're being prosecuted for sedition and Mr. Puigdemont and Comín are being prosecuted for uh, malfeasance of funds. There is no evidence whatsoever of malfeasance of funds and sedition is an open-ended panel box in which you can fit anything, but certainly there's been no violence whatsoever in all our, all our political action. And it was very clear by the, uh, the, the, the court at Zoetis Holstein in the case of Mr. Puigdemont that they very clearly said there is nothing that could similar, be similarly related to a crime of sedition. So there is no grounds for the accusation. That's the other fundamental. So, and the, the position of the Spanish MEPs that are, you know, supporting the lifting of immunities, oh, we don't have to look at that, we don't have to look at that. But, you know, that is, that is not true. When there is clear evidence that there is no evidence, they do have to look at that. You know, if, uh, uh, why? Because the fact that there is no, that there is clear evidence, there is no evidence, is evidence that this is a political prosecution, and that's the that's the bottom line. This uh, this immunity should not be lifted because it aims at stopping our political activity, and you know that's what the judge in the Supreme Court uh, wants by treating us as criminals. He is criminalizing a whole political movement. When you say that uh, what we do, our political activity is criminal, basically what you're saying is, well, you know, there is no other way. It's, it, you know, you can just turn around the argument. If this is criminal, well, well what, what can we do? You know, I mean, do we have political rights or don't we? If everything uh, you know, if our political action is criminal, then you're telling us you cannot represent the Catalans, you cannot have political action. Anyway, so that's, that's the, you know, our defense in very wide uh, terms. Thank you very much. Okay, and now Dr. Heltins, um, last January, uh, Belgium officially rejected Spain's attempt to extradite the former Catalan Minister of Culture, Luis Puig, after prosecutors gave up on further legal challenges. Following the decision by the Brussels Appeal Court to dismiss the international arrest warrant. A, days, a few days later, Belgium's Prime Minister, Mr. De Croo, compared Spain to other states such as Poland and Hungary, calling them to respect the rule of law. It is a fact that an essential part of Spain's lawfare against Catalan representatives is taking place on Belgian soil. How would you describe the perceptions of both uh, Belgian public opinion and political establishment considering the Catalan issue and especially Spain's actions against Catalonia? Uh, well, uh, let me say first that I am very, very glad that uh, Belgian authorities until now refused to extradite uh, the Catalan uh, ministers. Uh, I was very sad and very upset when, to, when they decided to extradite uh, the Basque woman Gaone uh, a few months ago. Um, it was against a, a long-standing tradition of Belgian justice, uh, which goes back to the 70s and were always uh, was refused to extradite people to Spain for the very good reason that Spain never could guarantee that those people would be treated in a human and democratic way. Yeah? So... Uh, it's a good thing that they uh, refused the extradition. I think in the 
political level, I think that the Catalan question, the Catalan uh, roadmap to independentism has a large sympathy among Flemish nationalism, which in the north of the country is, of course, uh, a, a major political force. Uh, we have as, uh, as, as the largest party until now the NVA, which is clearly in support of uh, Catalan independentism. And I was very, very amazed that from 2014 till 2017, when the NVA controlled the Flemish government and the federal government of Belgium, that they never, as Belgium, condemned on the international scale openly the repression the, the, uh, of their co-European member state, Spain. There was a large, a, a small attempt by the prime minister, Louis Michel, which you know now because he also uh, ascended to Europe and he was invited by the then uh, prime minister of Spain, Mariano Rajoy, and they talked 10 minutes and it was over. And there it was just a slice critique on uh, the violence used during the referendum, which deserved much more than a slice critique. So I was quite amazed at the NVA when they were in the political position to make a difference. They even, they of whom we all know that they are clearly in support, that they even didn't dare to make Belgium do a clear stance uh, towards Catalonia. There is one exception, I must say, and that was the president of the Flemish parliament, Jan Peumans, who said Spain is not a normal democracy. He said it openly and then uh, Spain withdraw uh, the, the, the powers, let's say, uh, the mandate of the Flemish diplomatic uh, represented in Madrid, and they closed the Flemish house. So uh, I was very glad that Jan Peumans dared to say it, but the federal Belgian government didn't say it. A second, and this, this is very important, a second large Flemish nationalist party who says also that it supports the Catalan struggles is the far right Flans Belang. That is, of course, not your fault. Eh? You don't choose who is the part of your question. And I know, I know uh, it sounds a bit strange, but lots of people of the far right in Flanders support the Catalan uh, question, support social mobilizations of the people in the streets, legitimate social mobilizations, while they do the reverse thing in their own country. And I'm not talking about the racism, the sexism, the anti-feminism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there, I would say, uh, watch out with those people. Uh, just a small anecdote. Uh, last week, I published a new book on the far right in Belgium and in Europe. I was attacked digitally in the thousands on Twitter and Facebook by those people. And it's almost for to cry, but lots of those people had in their profile of their account a yellow ribbon for uh, the freedom of the Catalan prisoners, which is probably the only good thing they, 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 they haven't they do. But it's, and you have people on the right in Flanders who say, yes, but we have to, because they have a lot of votes, uh, we have to give them, we have to tend them a platform as if you should give Vox and the, the, the far-right Catalanists of uh, 
uh, Frente Nacional, who I don't know how they call themselves, that, that small, tiny group, as if you would say, yes, they have to be invited on the platforms of Catalan television, etc., etc. So that is one thing to uh, stress. And a second thing to stress, which is painful, is that in Belgium, I think, large parts of the left, of the political left, don't really understand the Catalan issue. And that is a very important problem also. I think in the heritage, the classical heritage of the left, the right to self-determination has to be part of this. In Spain, in the Spanish state, in Catalonia, in the Catalan left, in the Basque left, in the Galician left, anyway, the right of self to self-determination is something that can be uh, put forward by left people. Here in Belgium, the problem is that the Catalan um, issue is read through Belgian glasses. And so, unfortunately, unfortunately, and very mistakenly, left forces tend to say, because the fact that the NVA supports Catalan people and that the NVA wants Flemish autonomy, confederalism, or even independence, we, from the left, have to be against it, which is a mistaken position. Eh? You have people in Catalonia, they go to the uh, voting polls, a majority of those people legitimately, whether you agree or not, votes for independentist parties, so you have to deal democratically with it. It's a political challenge, as I said, and you have to accept it, and especially if you are on the left. You're esp especially when you are on the left and when you say we are democratic, etc. And so there is a lot of teaching, of educating of some of the left forces in Belgium. And instead of saying, instead of saying, oh, look, watch out because NVA is supporting, let's say, Carla Ponsati, they should support her themselves. That's one of the important uh, issues, I think. So for the rest, I think what is, of course, uh, different, and that's my uh, last small point, what is different in Belgium with other uh, countries is that media, the media in Belgium, have a lot of attention for what is happening in Catalonia. Uh, that is because in Flanders we have some, I would not say similar debates, but the question of nationalism is also a very uh, largely existing uh, issue. Uh, and of course, because uh, the main political forces like the NVA uh, support Catalonia. And then you have some more, uh, more anecdotic reasons. The fact that a lot of Belgians go to Spain in summer uh, go to Catalonia, they went there, they, they know and they say, oh, what is happening there, etc., etc. I think also since 2017 and the images that all the world has seen, I think that on that very moment, most of the people, I would say most of the normal people were disgusted by the police attitude uh, and by the attitude of the Spanish uh, government. And they're very upset. Uh, unfortunately, it are feelings that, that don't crystallize in a large uh, movement. Uh, but I think on, on, on this very moment, each evening, uh, we see on the Belgian television, on the public broadcast, uh, Flemish broadcast, we see the images of the savage uh, attitude of uh, Policia Nacional, uh, etc., against uh, demonstrators. Uh, so th that is known very well in Belgium. Okay, thanks. Uh, also, you are an expert on nationalism, and 
And usually uh, Catalans are accused by the Spanish government of being nationalist because nationalism has a, a bad press. But we always say there's also a, a Spanish nationalism that is not taken into account. Of course. So, of course, that is, uh, <laughs> yes, of, of course, I think there is, there, there is a huge Spanish nationalism, which is from another content than Catalan nationalism. Uh, it has to do with uh, very ancient traditions as casticismo, etc., etc. But when you see as Vox, uh, it is uh, a Spanish nationalist party, Ciudadanos is, Partido Popularis, and even Partido, Partido, uh, the PSOE is, is, is too. Uh? Uh, all of them waving the Spanish flags against the Catalan flags. You could say in one, in one sense that the Catalan road to independentism triggered that nationalism in involuntary, of course, triggered that nationalism. But the, what, what is today Vox was already existed, existed already. It was mainly in the Partido Popular and with the crisis of the Partido Popular, it's huge corruption from, from, from above till top down uh, you you had that that kind of new uh, political formation but that Spanish nationalism is very yeah, very dangerous it is in fact a bit the mirror of the nationalism what we have in Flanders with Flans Belang when you look at the political programs uh, and there again, the racism, anti-refugee attitude, uh, sexism, uh, etc., etc., and of course, racism. Even uh, Catalan people uh, uh, generalizing, generalizing uh, a viewpoint for uh, sovereignty to the Catalan human beings themselves, uh, and that is very, very uh, dangerous. What is happening uh, in? in Spain, not, okay. not, not to say the influence of that kind of ideas and of Vox itself inside the army and inside the police forces. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we're now already running, we, we finished with the main questions and uh, now we're running a little bit short of time. So we would ask to be a little um, uh, concrete on your answers. We have two questions from our audience. Uh, the first question, which is for both speakers, says, uh, why do you think EU citizens' human rights violations and breach, and breach of rule of law in Poland and Hungary, oh, excuse me, why do you think European Union criticizes human rights violations and breach of rule, rule of law in Poland and Hungary, but keeps being silent when Spanish authorities do so? Anybody wants to well, answer? Uh, my view is well because Spain is part of the you know of the Central Western Coalition in the EU. Uh, there is a uh, you know there is a Western a Western bias in the distribution of power in the EU, uh, and the central parties, the EPP, the Liberals, and the Social Democrats, uh, are not in power in Poland, that probably explains Poland. Hungary is different. Uh, we're going to see, you know, uh, there has been sort of a very active uh, um, scrutiny of what was going on in Poland and Hungary, mostly from the small countries of Europe. It's not, you know, it's not the the big powers, but it's been very active on the part of, say, the you know the Nordic, uh, um, Holland, Austria. So the, the small uh, they have a name. I don't remember the name now. The small parties that are concerned about uh, these countries being sort of very opportunistic in taking the money, but not providing the political uh, public goods that they are they should be obliged to they've been not as critical you know spain has done very similar things but they are you know somewhat myopic about that 
uh, but you know, I think that's part. But we'll see sort of, you know, uh, we'll see, um, I suspect that uh, uh, Germany is going to be more and more, uh, you know, tolerant of uh, Hungary. Uh, I mean, there has been probably, a, you know, a bit of uh, indirect negotiation between Orban and Merkel, and we'll see how how far we get. I think they are going to be some, some you know, quite uh, not so critical in the next in the coming um, uh, weeks, uh, months. But anyway. Mm-hmm. I don't know what uh, professor thinks about that. Uh. No, no, I, I largely I largely agree. I think uh, uh, Hungary and Poland who are called illegal, uh, 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 sorry, illiberal regimes. Uh, it, it's clear yeah. they're more peripheric, per- peripheric and o- also chrono- chronicologically, they came with a g- big wave of extension from 2004 and after, while Spain was important when it entered in the 80s after the end of the dictatorships in the south of Europe. So Spain is more at the core of Europe and is sticking very strong to France, which is of course a key member. So that is all the, the difference as you, as you explained indeed. There is okay. also a matter of, you know, Human resources, there is a lot of Spaniards in the apparatus and they are very, very active and very, very powerful. And that has a lot of influence. It's, you know, it's behind the scenes, but, you know, we, we cannot uh, uh, dismiss uh, the importance of, you know, human resources in the commission and in the council. That's also, very, you know, and there is not as many Poles or Hungarians in positions of power. Okay. Thanks. Then uh, the second question is a question for Ms. Ponsadin. Uh, do you think, uh, what do you think uh, it needs to happen for the EU to react and start tackling Spain's repressive actions so, so it stops losing soft power overseas and dealing, in dealing with Russia, Turkey, or China? I don't know for sure. I mean, I think that Mr. Borrell is helping. Uh, you know, there is still, uh, there is, he has still, hopefully he'll have, you know, further opportunities to, to, uh, to, to, to embarrass the union, uh, you know, because his inconsistency is so clear. And in his case, it's, it's more than inconsistency. It's, you know, there is clearly, a, you know, a, a matter of capacity. Uh, so, but, uh, you know, what needs to happen? Well, I think what needs to happen, we need to just, you know, unrelentlessly, you know, keep pointing at the inconsistency. We need to nonstop. It's a bit, uh, it's kind of boring, right? I mean, I sometimes when I am in the plenary of the, of the European Parliament, and once again I tell them, "Hey, you guys, you you hypocrites, you know, this is wrong." You know, sometimes I say, "Well, I've told you that ten times. Why should I tell you another?" Well, okay, it's my job to tell you another time, uh, and it's everybody's uh, obligation, I would say. You know, all the that support us and all the Catalans that are in positions in which they can express their views that to keep denouncing uh, the abuses of human rights uh, in Spain and to keep denouncing the hypocrisy of, you know, if you don't defend human rights at home, don't go and tell the Chinese what they, they uh, need to do that's the you know the other thing we have to tell is to you know to explain that to everyone so that uh, you know mr the mini the 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 russian uh, um, politicians which certainly have not my sympathy but hey uh, the fact that they don't have they don't have my sympathy well it's good that they have the information uh, and you know everybody should have the information, and so that we need. That's what we need to keep uh, keep doing. You know, it's uh, to be patient, to be perseverant, mostly. You know, insisting. Yes, well, uh, it, it is true that I've heard some independentist leaders say that Mr. Borrell is our best asset. So, 
following what you said. Well, it's a good asset for <laughs> Okay, well, those were the two questions we had. I don't know um, if um, we should be finishing now. So I would like to thank you, thank both of our speakers tonight, uh, Dr. Clara Pusati and Dr. Vincent. I, sorry. I, I always have problems with you playing <laughs> Heltins, excuse me, uh, for their assistance and for your participation today. Also, we'd like to thank uh, the, the, all the many viewers we've had uh, through the media and who follow this debate via Facebook or uh, YouTube. And thanks all of you. And we hope to see you again soon in our next conference. Good night.